some of you <laughs> may not know me, so or know me very well. So I um, <coughs> one of the pastors here. Last couple of months, I've been preaching at various churches around West London. I've been helping a church in in Hayes that uh, I'm pleased to say last week called me <coughs> pastor. So uh, I've been working with them and various other places as well. So. Um, this is the fifth church I've preached in in the last five weeks. It's something like that. So it's really good to be here uh, today. You're going to see more of me over the next um, couple of months. Most of you will know that I'm uh, currently working on a doctorate at Roehampton University. And uh, I'm about to run some focus groups here. So they'll start, the first one of those is next week. They will run through until um, the end of April. And uh, it's part of the research looking uh, at the creation of, of genuinely multi-ethnic congregation. That's what I'm looking at. So, um, and the other thing that I do, just <laughs> I also work at Waverley Abbey College, where I uh, am the programme lead for a Master's in Spiritual Formation. So, but none of that is why I'm here this morning. I'm here to talk about God's Word with you. So, if you've got a Bible, do turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Um, on the Sundays when I've been here, I've been uh, doing, I suppose, an occasional series on, uh, on 1 Peter. Um, just to remind you that uh, Peter wrote this letter to encourage people. <coughs> so the people that he was writing to were having a little bit of a hard time as Christians. They were under pressure because of their faith. The society around them did not like the fact that they were Christians and were leaning on them or putting them under pressure. Um, now, just to say that the part of the passage today contains some of the most obscure verses in the New Testament. And uh, just to get you ready for that, so when I read that you'll think, what? But we're going to work on it and make sense of it together. So, uh, just to tell you that. Now, who sometimes, who's here, who sometimes feels under pressure because of their faith? Sometimes you're under pressure not to do something which you know is the right thing to do, or under pressure to do something that's the wrong thing to do. Who feels that sometimes? Yeah? Well, some of you, put your hands up honestly, some of you are being dishonest and not putting your hand up. Because there's something wrong with you, actually, if you don't feel under pressure sometimes, I would suggest. And this passage is for us, people who feel under pressure because of their faith. That's what it's about today. So, we begin 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, and we're going through to chapter 4 and verse 6. Let's see if I can turn this around slightly. There we go. Christ suffered for our sins once for all time. He never sinned. But he died for sinners to bring you safely home to God. He suffered physical death, but he was raised to life in the spirit. Amen? Amen. This is the heart and centre of our faith. All of us have done things wrong. Yes? Not so sure over this side. All of us have done things wrong. Yes. 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 The Bible calls that sin. Things that we've done wrong in God's sight. And those things would naturally separate us from God. But Jesus came into our world. What we're going to be remembering as we uh, share bread and uh, wine later on. <coughs> Jesus came into our world. Jesus who never sinned. Lived in our world. And died was raised from death to make it possible for us who have sinned to come safely home to God. Now, if you've been a Christian like me for a long time, I'm, uh, I became a Christian in 1969. So, that's 50 years ago, later this year. Things like this, the fact that Jesus died on the cross, to make it possible to have sins forgiven, to find a relationship with God, to be more safely home to God, is something you sort of take for granted. Because for 50 years I've been living it. And we forget how amazing it is. In that song we sang at, at the beginning, God set his hope on us. Isn't it amazing? 
that the creator and sustainer of the entire universe sent his son into the world so that you, if you're here this morning, can you put your hand up? <laughs> Slightly more honest than earlier on, so that's better. So you, who put your hand up, so you can be brought safely home to God. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. <clears throat> So, difficult verses coming up. So he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Those who disobeyed God long ago when God waited patiently <coughs> while Noah was building his boat. Now, it won't surprise you to know that Christians disagree about the meaning of these verses. In fact, someone has counted that there are over 180 different interpretations of these couple of verses that you can currently find in print in commentaries. Now I've spent a long time looking at the main interpretations and I'm not going to bore you by listing them out. I'm just going to tell you what I think these verses mean and why I think they mean them. Uh, but I want you to bear in mind that other Bible teachers will have other understandings of these verses. So this is, this is what I think is the case. But you know, if you read some other commentaries, listen to others, you may find something different. So the first thing, when we come across a passage in the Bible that's a bit difficult to understand, <coughs> the first thing we need to do is to try and think about how the people at the time would have understood the passage. When they got this letter, and they had it read to them in church for the very first time, because Peter would have sent the letter, a messenger would have come along to the to the the congregation meeting on the Sunday and would have read the letter, what would have come into the people's minds when they heard that read for the first time? So that's the first question. So, I want to take you back to some passages in the book of Genesis. So you're welcome to turn back or you're welcome to listen, whichever you prefer. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21 to 24, first of all. This is relevant. You're going to think, that's a bit odd. It is directly relevant. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. After the birth of Methuselah, Enoch lived in close fellowship with God for another 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters. <laughs> Enoch lived 365 years walking in close fellowship with God. Then one day, he disappeared, because God took him. Jump forward a few verses to chapter 6, and verse 1. Then the people began to multiply on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw the beautiful women, and took any they wanted as their wives. Then the Lord said, my spirit will not put up with humans for such a long time, for they are only mortal flesh. In future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. In those days, and for some time after, giant Nephilites lived on the earth. For whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women, they gave birth to children who became the heroes and famous warriors of ancient times. The Lord observed the extent of human wickedness on the earth, and he saw that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he'd ever made them and put them on the earth. It broke his heart. Now, good morning. Welcome. Do come in. <laughs> we know that both the stories of Enoch and the story of Noah were well known and widely respected in the area that Peter was writing to at the time that he was writing. In fact, local coins from that time, on one side, as you would expect, had a picture of the emperor. <laughs> on the other side, which you wouldn't expect, they had a picture, and in inverted commas, of Noah and his wife. Why was that so much interest in Noah and his wife? Well, 
It was believed that the final resting place of Noah's Ark, you know, after the flood and the Ark settled down, was actually in this area. So the people had a particular interest in that story. There was also, in local circulation at the time, a book claiming to have been written by Enoch. And that book massively develops the Genesis story, which I just read you a little bit of. <coughs> including references to fallen angels who came around and had sex with human women, producing giants, and also evil spirits who corrupted the earth and were at the time of the flood imprisoned by God for eternity. So at the time of the flood, not only was everything on earth wiped out under the mops in the ark, but according to this book, the book of Enoch, that was in circulation at the time, God also took the evil <coughs> spirits on the earth that we just read about in Genesis and put them in prison. You with me so far? Mm -hmm. You're thinking, what has this got to do with us in Greenford in 2019? We're getting there. Because this actually is really relevant to you. What, Pastor David? Yes, it is. We are going to get there in a few minutes. So... Another important thing to look at when we look at some verses that don't make a lot of sense to us is to look at how they fit in to the passage. And there is a progression here from <coughs> verse 18 through to verse <coughs> 22. So in verse 18 we have Jesus dying and being made alive. In verse 19 we have him, it just says, he went. In verse 22 we have him ascending to heaven. So what I believe is going on here, what this passage is referring to, is that Jesus, after his resurrection, but before his ascension, going to the place where these spirits were held in prison, since the time of Noah, they've been there a long time, and proclaiming to them his victory and their eternal defeat. We're going to come back to that in a moment and see why that's relevant to us. Let's read the rest of verse 20 down to verse 22. Only eight people were saved from drowning in that terrible flood. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. It is effective because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He's seated in the place of honour next to God. And all the angels and authorities and powers accept his authority. So Peter here is now drawing more lessons from the story of Noah. And particularly he's making a comment about the importance of baptism. He's saying that everyone outside the ark perished. Only those inside the ark were saved. And he's making the point, everyone naturally on earth will perish unless they are saved through baptism in baptism through the resurrection of Jesus. And it reminds us that baptism is not an optional extra. It's not something which we can think, well, I've become a Christian now, maybe I'll be baptised. Maybe I won't. It actually is, according to the New Testament, a part of the process of conversion. It's a part of the process. And I would say to you, if you've not been baptised, that process of you becoming a Christian, of you coming to faith, is not yet completed. Peter is saying here very clearly, and this is only one of the places in Scripture it makes this point, that it's not an optional extra. It's part of the process. So let's think about this passage and let's think about ourselves and let's see what this has got to say to us. And I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. Those of you who are used to my preaching, you will know 
that uh, I ask questions and they're not normal preachers <coughs> questions because you're going to tell me the answer. Is that okay? Yeah. You're going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's think about those first listeners, those first receivers of Peter's letter. They were a small minority in their society. They were under pressure because of their faith. So Peter is drawing a parallel with the time of Noah, when those who were faithful to God were under huge pressure because across the world, people were in total opposition to God and to his standards. He, as we read about it in, in Genesis, total evil all the time. And by drawing that parallel between that time and the time of Noah, they could be encouraged that God does not forget about a few righteous people who are struggling in a godless society. Do you know how sometimes it feels? You're in a situation and you're under pressure and it feels I'm the only one in this situation who believes in God. Do you feel like that sometimes? And so Peter is saying, think of Noah. God did not forget Noah and his family. Even though the whole of society was entirely corrupt. God didn't forget Noah. God's not going to forget you. And now... Breaking news, which wasn't true in Noah's time. Jesus has been raised from death and has defeated all the powers of darkness. All the powers that oppose him and his people. And judgment will come for all who do not follow God in responding to Jesus through baptism. But ultimately, God is in control. Amen. Ultimately, God is in control. Amen. So... Let's think about ourselves. <coughs> think about us now, here in February 2019, here in Greenford in West London, on a lovely sunny day, freezing cold, but a lovely sunny day. <coughs> so, how does this passage, how does this story that Peter's brought to the church of his time, how does that apply to us today? What is God saying to us What's God saying to you this morning through this passage? That's the question. <coughs> I thought I'd start with a difficult question. I might ask an easy one later on, but I thought I'd start with a difficult question. You're used to asking, answering questions from me. So, what's God saying to us this morning? <laughs> Islam, Buddhism, all the religions are there. And Christian, as a Christian, <coughs> we're so used, we feel uncomfortable sharing our beliefs and our way of life and what we believe in. Because, oh, you're just a religious person. And sometimes you think, how do I answer that? It's, well, I'm not religious, I'm a Christ follower. And that's what I'm battling with, personally. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, for me, um, it gives me uh, confidence, it encourages me that no matter um, the struggles and the things that, it, that is just a life that we have to deal with, sometimes you can feel overwhelming and think, oh, 
what if this goes this way, that goes the other way, blah, blah, but that you will be with me and bring me through the other side. <coughs> Thank you. Anybody over here? See, we live in a society mm -hmm. today that is dominated by secular values, values that are against God. Mm -hmm. that believe that God is an irrelevance, God doesn't exist. And that is, that is the value system that <laughs> dominates the society in which we live here. <clears throat> so the pressure is, in every situation, you, you, you want to do what's right before God, don't you? And yet, in your work context, in your family context, in your social context, that becomes difficult. The encouragement is God knows. God understands. And the powers of darkness, they are defeated. We're going to come back to that in a few minutes. Let's go into uh, chapter 4. So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. You won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you'll be anxious to do the will of God. You've had enough in the past of the evil things that godless people enjoy, their immorality and lust, their feasting and drunkenness and wild parties, and their terrible worship of idols. Of course your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. <coughs> so they slander you. But remember that they will have to face God, who will judge everyone, both the living and the dead. That is why the good news was preached to those who are now dead. So although they were destined to die like all people, they now live forever with God in the Spirit. Peter says, arm yourselves. It's another aspect of the spiritual armour, God's armour, the armour of God. We read about that in Ephesians. Here's another aspect of it here. And this is an attitude of being finished with sin. The logic here is this. If someone is willing to suffer for their Christian faith, then they are finished with chasing their own desires. All the different things listed in verse 3 here, immorality, lust, feasting, drunkenness, wild parties, terrible worship of idols, they were all normal aspects of social life at the time that Peter was writing to the people in the society that he was writing, particularly in connection with the pagan temple. In those temples, there was all of this was just normal behaviour. And it was in other social contexts too. And Peter's saying such behaviour is unacceptable for Christians. And what was true then is also true <laughs> now. <coughs> that includes drunkenness, includes sex outside of marriage. Now those things in our society today have become quite acceptable. Both of those things. Quite acceptable, it's quite okay, quite normal. Even I find those views among Christians. But it's not okay. It might be normal in our society, but it's not okay. We need to be behaving the way that God wants us to behave. The fact is that behaviour like this, as Peter lists here, is wrong. He talks about the fact that, that when people became Christians, their lifestyle changed. And their friends didn't like it. It reminds me of a, of a testimony I, I was reading uh, recently. This... Uh, student at the university and uh, you know, used to go out and get drunk and 
all of the sorts of things that sometimes students do at university, became a Christian. And so decided to stop drinking altogether and also stop having sex. And his friends gave him such a hard time. What's wrong with you? Are you saying the way that what we're doing is wrong? You, you get the drift here? <coughs> This was what was happening in Peter's time. People were becoming Christians. Their lifestyle was changing. And they were getting slandered. They were getting abused for the fact. That now they were being obedient to God. Their lifestyle is saying, this is not an acceptable way to behave. Peter reminded those that were going to listen to his letter of the fact that everyone that's everyone in this room everyone in our society around us, every single person that you know will have to give an account to God of how you've chosen to live and God's standards <coughs> are not flexible. Behaviour that is wrong is wrong, whether you accept it or not. Yeah, I get this in, in our society. It's like, well, you know, that's all right for you. But of course, you know, I'm more enlightened than that. It's all right for me to behave like this but you know if, if, if your faith in God means you can't go out and have a good time my, my friend you know I feel sorry for you God's standards don't work like that if it's wrong it's wrong and everyone everyone you and I and everyone you know will give an account to God and those standards apply to everyone whether they accept it or not the other thing is that how things appear in human terms when we're looking, isn't how things actually are. I'll say that again. How things appear to human <coughs> sight is not often how things actually are. Because God sees beyond that. So here, for example, there are people that have died. Well, they seem to have died. They're physically dead. But actually they haven't died <laughs> completely because they are now alive with God. Physically, at this point in time, they are dead. They're going to get a new body in due course. But they're now alive with God. So how things appear in human eyes is not how things are. People look at those that have dying, died for their faith. We have more martyrs in this generation of the Christian faith than in any other generation historically. More people dying today for their faith than in any other generation. Not in the UK, but in our world. And you could look at people that have died young for their faith and think, oh, what a wasted life. That's human way of looking at it. They are now at peace, living with God. Amen? Amen. So it's not as we look at with human eyes. So, final question. Only two questions today. There you've got a really light today. Only two questions. So, good morning. How does all this, what we've been looking at here in chapter 4, how does this apply to us today? That's all very well thinking about looking at this in Jesus' time, uh, in Peter's time. But how does this apply for us today? Yes. I'm glad you're here too. <laughs> I think, this is what I'm getting from it. No, no, I think I know. It's what we're being asked to do. Mm -hmm. So it's an under we have to have an understanding of where, what we're being asked to do, meaning walking the narrow path. Even though the other path might seem a bit more attractive. 
Right, thank you. <coughs> Anybody else? Yeah. For me, it's, it's having the courage to be different, but actually, but then we shouldn't hide from the world. But actually, we can be in the world. Mm -hmm. Because Jesus is about being in the world, but not of the world. So be in the world, but be different in the values that we live by. Yeah. Very good. Anybody else? Yeah, also, I think we lead, as Christians, we should tie the, tie the line with the life that God lays down for us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Also, yeah. also, to expect that other people, when they see those changes, will not will think it's strange and to expect that. Yeah. So, so you're not surprised. So, not be surprised when other people don't like the changes that they see in our lives. Yeah. Very good. Anything else? It can have a different effect, though. Sorry, say again. It can have a different. So, I've lived that. Uh -huh. One of my closest friends, <coughs> since I got baptized, has just completely drifted. Completely drifted. But the turnaround is, in, in, in as much as she's drifted, I've left your connections open. And I can see that God is working in her life, mm -hmm. even though she's not calling me or making contact through all these social medias. I can see through things she's putting up now on social media that God is making her look at her life. Mm -hmm. And I, all I've done is pray for her. I haven't actually said anything to her, but it's working. It's working. Right. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else? Howard Marshall, writing on this passage, he, uh, he said this, this is a, a bit hard, true, I don't, I don't mean hard in, in that he's being unfair, I mean he's, he's going to the real heart of what is in this passage. Christians must be prepared to suffer rather than revert to the lifestyle they followed before conversion. So, sum up what we've learned this morning. We need to stand firm. We should stand firm. We can stand firm. We are going to stand firm in God. Because Jesus died for us. Amen? Amen. God is in control. Amen. All the time. All evil powers are defeated. Amen? Amen. Amen. Everyone is going to face judgment. Amen? Amen. Including us. And we have eternal life in God. Final quote. A guy called Job's writing this passage. Christ is victorious over all evil. Even the most <coughs> depraved. For all time. Let's pray. I'm going to be quiet for a moment. Uh, you've been listening to me for a while. So it may well be there is something that's come to your mind that maybe the Holy Spirit has touched in your life as we've been uh, looking at his word. So I'll just give a moment for in silence you to make any response to God that you need to make. And then I'm going to lead us in prayer. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.